This is the Great Vocal Majority Podcast. Hey everybody, it's Tony Cotaspati with the Great Vocal Majority Podcast, and today is volume 47 that I've entitled, A Lie Repeated Often Enough. So let's get started. It's been said that a lie repeated often enough becomes the truth. That's a quote that some have mistakenly attributed to Hitler's propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, but it is actually more properly credited to Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, otherwise everybody knows him as uh, Vladimir Lenin. In the context of the current day, the often repeated lies are almost too numerous to list, but let's just take a look at two of the big ones, because I want to spend some time debunking these lies, because a lot of people look at this stuff, a lot of people, as you'll see, look at this stuff and just don't think it's a lie. They they accept it as the unvarnished truth. So let's do what I'll call the often repeated lie number one. And this relates to something that is much more current than uh, some of these lies. But uh, this one is where it was said that all 17 intelligence agencies confirm Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election. Now, this is flatly false. And those who continue to say it hope to put weight into the legitimacy behind the claim that Russia actually interfered in the election. And casual news observers will often look at a claim and see it go unchallenged, and that will lend further credibility that the claim is true. But the claim is totally false. Well, who are the 17 intelligence agencies that everybody keeps referring to? Well, the 17 intelligence agencies include a separate intelligence agency for each branch of the United States military, one for the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. That's four. And then there are four others which are also part of the Defense Department, namely the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the National Reconnaissance Agency, and the National Security Administration. Now, Homeland Security also has two intel agencies, one of which is the Coast Guard, and the State Department has its own intel agency. The Treasury Department and the Energy Department each have their own intel agencies, and the DOJ has two intel agencies, one of which is contained within the FBI, and the other is the Drug Enforcement Administration. And finally, we have the CIA. Now, all of those agencies that I just named are overseen by another agency, which is acts like as an umbrella organization, and that's called the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. So, after you hear all those names, do you remember hearing any of them coming out and saying, rendering a decision about Russian interference in the election? No, no, you didn't. So where did the lie about all 17 intel agencies confirming Russian interference in the election, where did that come from? Well, the answer is it came from James Clapper, who at the time was the director of the Office of National Intelligence. That is the man at the top of the umbrella organization that oversees all those agencies. And because he rendered a decision... Liberals and Democrats simply took license for that to say that all 17 agencies rendered a decision when they never rendered any decision. It was just James Clapper who rendered a decision. He never actually said all 17 agencies that report to me made this determination. But partisan Democrats just wanted to add more weight and credibility to their claim that the uh, that the election result was tainted. So they pushed this false narrative that all 17 agencies rendered an opinion on the Russian meddling. And it was totally false. Okay? So I think that essentially debunks that lie. And if you have any doubts about that, 
Go ahead and Google it. Google the the geospatial intel agency and see and, and Russian interference and see if there's anything there about how they confirmed in air quotes, confirmed Russian interference in the election. Now, I don't do this to suggest that there was no Russian interference in the election. I don't know. All I'm saying is, is that the people making the argument are exaggerating, and I think deliberately exaggerating, what the intel agencies and the leadership of the intel agencies actually said. The number two often repeated lie, and this is really, this is like the big banana, this one. And that is that the Republicans had a Southern strategy to, quote, switch sides with Democrats in the South, particularly, where the GOP would support white supremacist and segregationist policies. Now, of all the lies, arguably, the worst is this revisionist historical meme that segregationist white supremacist Democrat Southerners switched parties after the enactment of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Now, current day Democrats hiding behind the passing of two complete full generations revise history. They lie, they conflate, they exaggerate. What actually occurred in order to slander the GOP with a racist label. In other words, what I'm saying here is, is that with the passage of time, it's so much easier to, to, to distort what actually happened. And the Democrats have done a really amazing job at that. And I think there are actually people who totally believe, and I'm talking about not, not just average Americans walking around. I'm talking about educated people actually believe that there was this switching of sides. They've actually convinced themselves of this lie. It's, it's, it's stunning, but I'm going to debunk it for you. And, uh, and I think it's important that it get debunked because this is, this is a vicious, terrible lie that, that Democrats use today to try to maintain this moral high ground that they are the defending they are the defenders of everything pure so what actually happened well let's start with president johnson lbj now he was a fierce opponent of civil rights and it's hard to argue that he wasn't because when he was the leader of the senate long before he became vice president or president lyndon johnson was the Harry Reid of his day, and he filibustered and watered down every attempt by the Eisenhower administration to pass civil rights legislation. Remember, it was the Eisenhower administration that went to court and won Brown versus Board of Education. It was the Eisenhower administration that had to send in the 82nd Airborne to Little Rock, Arkansas, to escort black children to and from school every day because uh, Governor Forbes wanted to block integration of the public schools. And when Eisenhower put forth his proposals for civil rights legislation, it was blocked and watered down, so it was much less effective by Lyndon Johnson. But then we entered the 1960s, President Kennedy was assassinated, and Lyndon Johnson became the president. And what was on television... Every night, almost, were these images of white segregationists in the South brutalizing black people for having the audacity to want to have a public education for their children or equal rights. So there were rising tensions in the South because of all of this, and it was in the news a lot. And LBJ was smart enough to know that the Democratic Party in the South needed to change its approach when it came to race, or there was con or the continuous news coverage was just going to eat away at Democrat Party support, and they would never win another election. I mean, that's the God's honest truth. So 
the president made a deal with the black leadership of the civil rights movement. Until then, and since the end of the Civil War, Southern blacks voted overwhelmingly Republican. I mean, of course, why, would, why wouldn't they vote Republican? It was the party of Lincoln. Lincoln freed the slaves. This was a big deal. And for the, and for the white Southerners, Lincoln was anathema. The Republican Party was anathema. People died because of the Republican Party in the South and their families in the Civil War. So, of course, there would be a lot of animosity, especially just a mere 100 years after the, the, the Civil War. A hundred years is not that long when you consider the lifespans of people. I mean, that means that your grandparents or great grandparents may have a living memory of of, of uh, such things that happened during the Civil War. There was a lot of animosity, and black people did vote Republican for the most part. Johnson lured the black leadership with promises, saying, "I listen, I'll pass." the Civil Rights Act, and I'll pass poverty programs that will help poor black people in the South. Just give me your support. And so that's what happened. There was the blacks began to support Democrats in the South. So it, it basically amounted to a bribe. And blacks began voting for Democrats in huge numbers. At the same time, the Dixiecrat Democrats, that is the segregationist white supremacist Democrats, were just as hostile to blacks and Republicans as they always had been. More importantly, with the lone exception of Strom Thurmond, no leading Dixiecrat Democrat senator or governor ever switched parties. And just as important, the Republican Party, the Republican Party never adopted any policy prescriptions that were aligned with the Dixiecrat agenda. They never did it. There simply was never this switching of sides that was claimed. It just didn't happen. And leftists will sometimes point to the Southern strategy of Richard Nixon and uh, the Southern strategy of Ronald Reagan, which, which was uh, put together by his uh, strategist, Lee Atwater. And they'll use that as, as what they think is evidence that the Republicans switched sides. But none of it's true. I mean, it's all exaggerated and it's it's taken out of context. It's there's so many things that they do to weasel their way into this definition of like this switching of sides. If you take each one of these things out of their historical context, it, it could give you a false impression that the left uh, argument appears to be credible. But in co but context is important when it comes to history. So let's talk about, for example, Nixon's Southern strategy, which claimed that Nixon would exploit racial tensions to win the white votes in the South. In the 1968 election, Nixon ran against, he ran against Hubert Humphrey, the Democratic candidate, who was also a liberal, and Governor George Wallace, who was the Alabama governor, and a Dixiecrat. And he was in a party called the American Independent Party. Now, George Wallace was an infamous segregationist who blocked blacks from entering schoolhouses in Alabama, just like Orville Favitz did in, in, in Arkansas. And Wallace, in the presidential election, was able to carry five southern states, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Nixon only won a majority in Florida and a plurality in the Carolinas and in Tennessee. So whatever Nixon's Southern strategy may have been, it didn't work. And the racist, the actual racist Democrat in the race, because George Wallace was a Democrat, he may have been running on an independent ticket, but he was a Democrat. He ran, he's the one that put, pitted the races against each other, and he won five states. So as Nixon entered office in 1969, this is the... the the racist Nixon, right? Nixon entered office in 1969. And at that time, two thirds of Southern black Southern students attended segregated school. Actually, it was over two thirds, something like almost 70 percent of, of students of black students in the South attended segregated schools, even though from the passage of the Civil Rights Act all the way through to the day that LBJ left office in 1969, there were desegregation orders that were out there that Johnson failed to administer. 
The same Johnson that stood in the way of every Civil Rights Act in the 1950s. So you see the politics here? It's Johnson who was the racist. It wasn't the Democrat. It wasn't the, the Republican Nixon who was, the, who was using a strategy. I mean, Johnson made all these promises, and then he failed to carry them out, especially the desegregation orders. When Nixon entered office, he desegregated the school so fast, he did more in the first year in office, according to Tom Wicker. Now, if you don't know who Tom Wicker was, Tom Wicker was a liberal, a liberal commentator, and he actually said that the Nixon administration did more in 1970 to desegregate the southern school systems than had been done in the previous 16 years. Now, why is he used 16 years? He's talking from the time that Brown versus Board of Education was decided by the Supreme Court in 1954. That's what he's, he's saying, which was also decided because why? Because a Republican Justice Department under Dwight Eisenhower fought that case out. And by 1974, Richard Nixon had driven down the number of black students in segregated schools from 68% in 1969 to 9% by the time Nixon resigned his, his presidency. That's the truth behind the Nixon Southern strategy that you will never hear from liberals on the left. By the 1980 election, 16 years had passed since the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, it's important to say that because Americans were coming a vo who came of voting age in 1980 were entering elementary school after the Civil Rights Act was enacted. Even in the segregated South, the wide majority of blacks were attending desegregated schools by the time 1980 rolled around and had been for the last previous 10 years. This is significant because the racial and political landscape in the South was changing. The South of 1980 wasn't the same South as of 1964 or 1954. It was very different. This, the Civil Rights Act, Brown versus Board of Education, the whole civil rights movement actually was making things change. But when liberals make this Southern strategy argument, they don't want you to believe anything changed. They want you to believe that the racists that were out there in the South were the same people 26 years later in 1980 in the South. And it's just not true. I mean, a lot of those older generation people who did have those racial antipathies died off. And a, and a lot of young people grew up in the civil rights era and never knew a day of, of segregation. So it was, it was, this is how they conflate things. And they, they, they compress history so that everything looks like it's nothing has changed. And it's, it's completely false. It's just a way to mislead you into believing something that isn't true. The racial animosities by 1980 were clearly ramping down. I mean, they just clear, they clearly were. And uh, people who were opposed to integration 16 years earlier had different, less racially intemperate concerns. I mean, once, once the civil rights act began to take hold, then people had less of a reason to be as, uh, I guess the word would be fearful that, uh, that, they, that integration would, would be a problem. So, you know, it, it, their concerns shifted. See, the Reagan Southern strategy did exist, but it didn't target people based on race, really. I mean, what it did was it just right, tried to recognize the racial landscape for what it was. People who were concerned about integration 25, 30 years before then were not concerned about that anymore. We're concerned more about economics issues. So when the Southern strategy was devised by Lee Atwater, he realized that the people who could be grabbed with votes by by using racial inflammatory language w could no longer be uh, you know that wouldn't be something that the Republicans would be interested in trying to get their vote but now those voters were were, were more concerned those people would were more concerned about economics issues so they would they would try to get their votes by 
approaching them on economic topics, which pretty much every election that ever happens centers on. So what does the left do? They they pull out an interview that Lee Atwater did in 1981 where he uses racial slurs to describe the shifting attitudes of the voting public in the South, the white voting public. So he, so he uses the, the N-word. He, he uses the saying, this is what those voters wanted to hear, you know, back then. Now they want to hear it's something different. It's, it's taxes, it's spending, it's, it, you know, it's forced busing for, you know, to integrate the schools. You know, that doesn't mean they're against integration, just means they're against having their children forced to go to schools that may not be, that may not be up to standards for them. It may have a racial component to it, but it also has a quality of education component too. I mean, so, you know, you can't just describe it to one thing. But if you're racially obsessed and you want to do that to try to, to, tr- to, try to smear your political opponent, then, then it will be, which is what the Democrats did. So what, 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 what Atwater was actually saying was that civil rights and desegregation had worked and that the shift in voter focus away from racial divisions and toward issues of, of prosperity were what was ruling the day, the, the economy and taxes – uh, and things like that. This this would be true in Atwood's estimation of whites as well as blacks. So race obsessed leftists have focused on Atwood's use of, of racial slurs as evidence of his bigotry. But in truth, Atwood was really just making a case that the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and desegregation efforts had become such a part of the fabric of Southern life, white Southerners who felt abandoned by the Democratic Party would find the GOP as a viable alternative, using economic and tax policy arguments. At no time did the Republican Party say, you know what, it's too bad we abandoned segregation. I mean, they never did that. They never did that. So again, there was no switching of sides, no blatant or even veiled appeal to racism. The problem here with the left is that they believe states' rights arguments are invalid because they only serve the so-called as dog whistles to races. But th- this is assertion breaks down under, under any kind of scrutiny. Voters of any race don't vote to hurt people. They vote to help themselves. Voting on issues of economics and taxes appeal to all people working, whether they're white or black. Government assistance programs have never suffered from a lack of funding. Those on the left who point to the Reagan Southern strategy, want to believe voters will vote to hurt other people and place their own interests in a subordinate position. Everybody knows that's that's not true. See, one of the things that I think a, a lot of uh, people on the left just don't want to believe is that racism is is actually leaving the American scene, whether they like it or not. And they don't like it because it's something that they need to keep power. It's really odd because... These people call themselves, many of them, call themselves progressives. And progressives generally believe that human beings progress. (laughs) But they somehow believe that human beings cannot possibly progress past racism. But human beings are progressing past racism. I mean, maybe not, maybe we'll never be stamped out entirely, but it's nothing like it was in 1964. And anybody who tries to make you think it is, is lying to you. What I'm really saying here is, is that you'll have, if you just look at both Reagan and Nixon, in their re-election effort, won 49 state landslide victories. Now, let me ask you, if Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan were really trying to pit the races against each other with a so-called Southern strategy, could they have ever won 49 states? 49 states Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, they would never have won victories like that. That's it for me. I'm Tony Cotaspati. This has been the Great Vocal Majority Podcast. Thanks for listening. Come to the website, greatvocalmajority.com, or the YouTube channel, and subscribe, and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you.